Institute of Technology, Bangalore. A brief introduction about Shanti Madam. Madam is a graduate in instrumentation technology from SJCE Mysore, postgraduate in digital electronics from Cochin University of Science and Technology, Cochin, and PhD in brain MRI from the University of Kerala. She has 30 years of teaching experience. She has around 25 publications in international conferences and journals with more than 150 citations. She holds patents to two medical devices, vein detector and digital dental tape, and the devices have been clinically validated. Her current research interests are in EEG signals, image processing, and deep learning. She is a senior IEEE member and has served as IEEE Women in Engineering Chair, Kerala section. She is the chief coordinator and main architect, backbone of this present FDP. I welcome you, ma'am, to take over the session. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Good afternoon, one and all. So, I suppose you're well into the third day of this uh, series. Bio instrumentation. So, which is uh, the upcoming uh, field owing to its importance in the health industry. Uh, there are a lot of uh, related areas uh, for this kind of uh, FDP and uh, I think all uh, uh, the different uh, topics have been uh, covered, have been included uh, properly in the FDP. Uh, the coordinator Ravish has taken care to include the various uh, topics, uh, choosing uh, people from different uh, areas of research. and. Um, I'm afraid there might be uh, a bit of repetition because I am uh, talking about the EEG signals and its uh, applications, EEG signals and applications. I think you must have heard a little bit uh, uh, about uh, the EEG signals in your earlier uh, sessions. And um, I hope uh, that most of you will be uh, just uh, the beginning to know about uh, things in this particular field or might be even a little bit of repetition shouldn't uh, bother you. Oh, I welcome each one of you once again to my brief uh, presentation on uh, EEG signals and their applications. So this is going to be my uh, the talk for the uh, today's uh, session, the last session, the EEG signals and its applications. And I just intend to cover uh, the basics of the EEG signals, uh, how it gets originated and how you are going to measure the EEG signals using uh, the different uh, electrode uh, setups and what are the classifications in EEG waves and a little bit about uh, the whatever uh, project works we carried out in our uh, department you, uh, in collaboration with uh, an R&D organization here in Bangalore and some was totally in in-house uh, project. So that is what I intend to present before you today. So before knowing about the EEG signals, all of us are aware about uh, the uh, brain and its um, anatomy. So I would just like to uh, take you uh, to the anatomy or the functional anatomy of the brain. So brain is mainly has got a larger cerebrum and a, a posterior a smaller part called as cerebellum, which is also called as brainstem. And this cerebrum is divided into the four important lobes depending upon the different functionalities that is associated with each one of the lobes. So they have been 
uh, classifications as frontal lobe, so the parietal lobe, a temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. So what you see here. Okay, so this is uh, how the brain lobes are classified, and uh, we know that each one of the lobes are associated with a particular uh, functionalities. And this is just for your interest. Let me tell you, the frontal lobe is associated with uh, the reasoning, uh, logical thinking, and motor skills and all. So this uh, portion of the brain uh, usually develops, uh, I mean, slowly develops, because okay? so you don't find uh, this uh, immediately. So this will be slowly developing things, so because you have to have the reasoning and the motor skills and all. So you don't find this very prominent in the children. And yeah, the parietal lobe, which is sensitive to the tactile information, the touch information, and the temporal lobe is responsible for the auditory senses, and uh, the most important region of the brain, the deep inside the brain, what we have, uh, the hypothalamus, which is the one from where like we recall all our uh, memory, and the occipital lobe at the hind end of the uh, skull, uh, brain, or uh, the head, so that is the occipital lobe, so mainly responsible for the vision. And uh, the cerebellum, uh, the stem of the brain, so this uh, fine tunes all the motory information. So that is the four different uh, portions of the lobes of the brain. So one need to have a little understanding about these uh, uh, lobes and the functionalities if you are working with an EEG signal. And this, again, uh, is one of the, the cross-sections of brain MRI. So this, uh, just to give you some idea about what's there within the brain. So we all know that we have what is called as a, a gray matter. So gray matter is the outer uh, cortical uh, structure, outer cortical structure, and the inner cortical structure is the white matter. And we have the entire thing suspended in what is called a cerebrospinal fluid, a CSF. It kind of provides... Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, like that's where the entire thing gets uh, the free from all the vibrations and all that. So this kind of protects and isolates the uh, brain in the entire skull region. So the darker portions, what you find here is all about the CSF fluid. So this is about the white matter, gray matter in that. And um, we just um, look into the fundamental uh, cell of the brain, so what each one of us know as a neuron. The most of us would have gone through this process of studying this in biology, the neurons, and which uh, forms so much. And actually, this neuron has uh, been an inspiration for what we call as the neural network, how the way the biological neuron performs. So based on this, the mathematical models have been deduced to introduce the neural network. So you have, and this is a biological neuron, so I'll just uh, mention what the function of that, so you'll be already knowing about it. So here the most important thing is, what you see here is the nuclear body, which is called uh, the soma. So this receives information from the billions of neurons that is this single neuron is connected to. It receives information from all the neurons uh, through these dendrites, it might respond or might not respond to all the information. So it's being very selective. And th that is uh, also like you have parallel processing capability because all the neurons are receiving input signals from all the neighboring uh, neurons. So kind of a, the parallel processing that happens in the brain is, uh, you know, is really tremendous, but then we pay selective attention or selective focus, that is what is decided by when this is going to fire and generate and spike, electrical spike. Okay? So that electrical spike is going to be the sum of all the input it's going to receive. So it might generate a distinct uh, amplitude spike and it might fail to uh, produce a distinct amplitude spike. So whenever a significant uh, spike like this happens, we say that the neuron has fired and this signal passes through the axon. So axon is something like the communication uh, unit and that is passed on to the neighboring neurons. So actually, this is the basic model uh, based on which we have the, uh, the 
a neuron, nonlinear neuron being devised in the neural network. And uh, this is uh, the wonderful phenomenon that takes place in the human body. So everywhere, so we have the little impulses, electrical impulses being generated. So if you visualize the entire human body and it's a fluidic and it has got a lot of ions, okay, so a lot of ions, the most important ions you have, sodium, potassium, chloride ions and phosphate ions, calcium ions, so very important ions we have. So the entire body is actually the fluid, and it's something like a fluid a dynamics. And so you have uh, the charge being uh, changing all the time. So this change in the charges is going to give us what is called as an action potential. So this is actually a very vast theory behind how an action potential is generated within a cell. So every cell is capable of generating an action potential. So and we have what is called as a rest potential. When the cell is at rest, the potential is usually, I mean, it is always negative and it's something around the minus 60 millivolt. We call that as a resting potential. And when you have, if you watch uh, this particular figure here, you can see that Na plus Na plus ions on one side and you have uh, some anions on the other side giving the negative charge and this gives a positive charge. So this is what is the scenario within the cell and this is outside and you have the cell membranes which are permeable and they're selectively permeable to only uh, some of the selective ions. So we have the uh, flow of this sodium ions from outside to inside and potassium ions from inside to outside because of the concentration gradient that exists in between or within the interface which this uh, permeable cell membrane is going to separate outside the cell and inside the cell. So it's a lot of um, you know dynamics that goes on here and that uh, finally so if you have a rush of sodium ions into the uh, cell through what we call as a gate, okay, sodium selective gate. So it's like the sodium selective gates opening up and sodium when it enters the cell, the rest in potential which was negative at minus 60 volts will start moving towards positive and we call that as depolarization. Slowly it moves to zero, gets depolarized and then it becomes charged to positive volt. It can go up to 50 to 55 millivolts and then once you have the entire sodium ions being shifted inside. So that is again going to create an inversion in the charges. So again, the inverse flow will begin. So that will give rise to what is called as repolarization. So this is what is happening specifically within every single cell in the human body. So, and you have this collectively giving rise to what is called as action potential. So thank God we have this action potential being generated within the human body. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got any clue about what's happening. Okay. It's only these things, this action potential, which happens within the basic cell. So here we're talking about the brain. So we talk about the neuron. So this action potential. So this action potential is nothing but a tiny electrical impulse. So that flows down. So it will be existing only for a few a milliseconds of time so before another pulse will follow or it, and it might be a longer time before another pulse will follow. So we'll have a short burst of electrical pulses that is being generated here. So this is very very important the action potential. The same kind of action potential is uh, uh, develops in the, uh, the human heart that is in a particular pattern and what we get is the PQRS wave. So we have the action potential so the, the dynamics behind the action potential is behind the coverage of this particular session or even uh, it doesn't uh, concern us to get too much into the details of that. But I expect that we should know there's something called as action potential that basically happens because of exchange of ions between outside the cell and inside the cell. Okay? And that results in taking up the potential from the resting potential all the way up to a larger potential. So if this was not happening, there wouldn't have been any signals, electrical signals or the physiological signal, what we call in biomedical. Okay, so this, uh, uh, a little bit about the history of EEG. So Hans Berger, a German physicist, uh, he was the one uh, supposed to have recorded the EEG signal somewhere in 1924 and 1929 during that uh, uh, period. 
So it was recorded uh, the EEG of a 19-year-old boy during a, a neurosurgery. But it is not the first time that the electrical activity of the brain was um, detected. So he's this is a recording that happened, but actually much before this, uh, a, a British uh, a physicist called as Richard Cotton, or he had and he is actually credited with uh, determining that there are tiny pulses that are being generated in the uh, brain. So he used galvanometer to detect the electrical activity. So that was the first time when uh, they realized that there is something called as an electrical activity happening. And later on, it went uh, further ahead. And uh, uh, somewhere around 1940 or so, the American uh, uh, society of uh, American Society of Medicine or something. I'm not very sure of that. So they set up the first EEG lab. So immediately after this uh, EEG was recorded, so around 1935 or 1940, the first EEG lab was uh, set up. Okay. So that was uh, the general uh, uh, description about how EEG was uh, 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 discovered uh, with uh, uh, and then uh, this particular uh, figure is just to give you an idea about uh, how the EEG signals are picked up from the scalpel. Okay? So you have all these electrical potentials being generated here. This particular diagram shows it to be very pretty neat, positive and negative charges. It doesn't happen like that. You'll be seeing very soon. So you will have some electrical activity generated, being generated here. So this is picked up through an electrode. Okay, very close to the scalp, you place the electrode and pick up the signal and we get the EEG signal. So electrodes are just a, a contact point. So we should have certain characteristics for the electrodes. They should uh, have a very good pickup of the electrical signal. So for that one need to prepare the scalp also. Okay, so just uh, get rid of all the a sweat, etc., and place these electrodes with the help of a gel to provide a proper contact and then try to get or try to record the EEG signal. So, we have various types of disposable uh, electrodes as well as reusable electrodes. So, what you see on this side is uh, a disposable set of uh, electrodes. And everybody would have seen this more or less like when you go for even any one of the ECG recordings, they use the same set of electrodes and these are the reusable electrodes so you have most of them the common one is silver silver chloride electrode and you also have the gold uh, plated uh, electrodes so these will uh, yeah, supposed to pick the signals without uh, losing the uh, signal a single electrodes we have and uh, this will not be sufficient for when you go for in-depth uh, study of the EEG signals, when it is applied to a particular field, so then you go for a larger number of uh, electrodes. Uh, electrodes of this electrode caps are being used, also called as a montage of electrodes. So it's a cap of electrodes. So they will be reusable, of course. And uh, sometimes like it will be saline based. So you just have to uh, immerse that in the saline water it dried and then just put it over there so that is only to provide a better uh, contact and uh, conductivity so we use this kind of electrode and these electrodes are, are pretty costly okay? so they're very costly all these um, uh, cap electrodes because for every electrode you need to have an electrical wire coming out and that becomes quite a, a mess is seen too many electrodes and and everything will be properly placed and when you have electrodes, minimum number of electrodes also, it is possible for us to carry out the routine laboratory work to show the students what is, how does an EEG looks like. So we can go for minimum number of electrodes. Otherwise, like in case of uh, typical applications when you use in sleep EEG lab or some such applications, you have to go for these electrode caps. And for everything, you have an uh, international system. Uh, so for the electrodes also, EEG electrodes also, so we have an international system of 1020 uh, electrodes. Yeah, so 1020 electrodes. So this is such that like, there is some kind of uh, uniformity in the EEG signals acquired and so that uh, researchers and uh, the clinicians can share whatever information that is available, provided the electrodes are placed at particular 
positions on the scalp and it uh, should be uniform. So with that uh, intention, so the uh, standard has been devised for 1020 electrode system. So this 1020 uh, does not mean the number of electrodes. It actually goes like this. If you look at the figure, so uh, this point is called as nation or nation, and this is the neon point. So nation point is actually uh, the a groove uh, or the you know the depression between the two eyes at the base of your nose ridge, base of your nose ridge, where you have a typical depression between the two eyes. So that is one of the reference points for the electrode measurement right under the forehead. That's called as the nation. And uh, the along uh, the uh, longitude, if you come, uh, you have at the bottom of the head, you, you can feel a ridge. Okay? So you can touch and feel a ridge. So that ridge is called as the ineon. So this becomes the overall uh, length over which you fix the electrodes when you are considering it on a longitudinal direction between nation and the union. So whatever this distance is, so this distance, based on in this distance, you space these electrodes at about 10% and 20% of the total distance. That is shown here. So from here to here, it is only 10% of the total distance between these two reference points. And here to here, it is 20% of the reference point. So the placement is either 10% or 20% of the overall distance between these two points, nascent and anion. So that is why it gets the 10, 20 percentage. Similarly, on the lateral side from year to year also, you have a placement of electrodes. So that comes again, you place them with a spacing of 10 to 20. So it's said that it comes around a spacing of around 6 to seven centimeters in a typical uh, adult. Okay, so you place it like that. And um, you have electrodes placed on the frontal region and you have it on the parietal region and occipital region and on the temporal region. So there is nothing like central uh, lobe in the brain, but uh, this comes along the center. So it is taken as the central uh, electrodes. So F, P, and O, T, etc. They all correspond to their the names given to the electrodes when they are placed on those particular portions of the brain. So temporal lobe, and you got occipital lobe. You got two electrodes in this case, and uh, frontal, uh, prefrontal. That is right in the front. Prefrontal, you got two electrodes, and frontal, you got two electrodes. And again, there's a convention that is being followed. So all the electrodes on the right side of the brain are given even numbers and all the electrodes on the left side of the brain is given the odd number. So this is a general standard because you know what's the advantage of going for a standard. So this is how the electrodes are always fixed. And once we have the electrodes, you choose the electrodes that uh, depending upon the application and depending upon the availability also. So coming ahead to the uh, measuring circuit of the EEG. So you know that the EEG amplifiers you have to use for all the signals will be using the differential amplifier. Uh, all of us are aware why we use differential amplifier because they have a maximum ability to reject a noise. So for every electrode, okay, so if I consider one position here, one, one electrode here, so you need to have one differential amplifier and the other point would be the reference point. So in this particular diagram, if you observe, the reference point and the two, uh, they're called as auricular regions between the, in the two ears, the two ears, you know, ears because the ear lobe is quite uh, uh, very soft. So you choose that as, so these two ears, like at the tip of these the ears, they are the soft, uh, uh, portions so you connect a uh, reference signal there so they become the major uh, reference signals in most of the application so that goes as other lead to all the differential amplifiers so every electrode will go to get connected to a differential amplifier and you will have one reference electrode there are many ways of choosing the second electrode the reference electrode this is one such a combination so what i meant to say is that so for every electrode that you place on the scalp you need to have an output coming out. So, so you will have 
number of outputs so they are called as channels so you will be having channels each channel will give you the electrical signal the each signal originating from that particular position so for every electrode that will give you the electrical activity you can record the electrical activity happening at that particular position okay and you can see uh, some uh, just to give an idea like this you can just uh, a node on the amplitude okay, so just 7 microvolts and 14 microvolts so it's very very feeble the eg signals what you pick this way and this is called as a non invasive means of picking eg signals okay, so because invasive is you have to go for the needle electrodes it pierce them and put them in directly in contact with the uh, brain okay, so with the brain or uh, above the uh, a surface should attach the brain, so we'll come to it later. So it's also happening. So most of the cases, what we have right now is uh, it is sufficient because the electronic circuit has uh, developed to such an extent that we can record easily with the available equipment the EEG signal that originates from there and you can uh, carry out many of the analysis parts. So, so as a researcher, we need not bother about going about for the invasive EEG electrodes so this is a typical setup and of course you need to have a uh, filter so before that let's this is how it would look like so a typical multi-channel EEG signal so depending upon how many number of electrical uh, how many number of electrodes you have so you, i told you with every electrode you'll be having one channel so typically an EEG signal is just nothing but a bundle of waveforms so what is called as an n symbol of waveform where each uh, waveform is different from the other. So this is just to give you a look about the EEG waveforms. And uh, those who are into signals and systems can give EEG signal as a best example for a random and a non-stationary uh, signal. Okay, so that's every. So that is why it's a random and it's non-stationary. So only for that matter, you need to have a large collection of these EEG signals to get any clue about what is happening. So they are always they always come in multi-channel. I told you so we have a lot of uh, sophisticated electronic equipments and even these softwares where uh, these channels can each one of the waveforms can be very easily analyzed. And whenever we have signals. So just the amplification is not sufficient. All of us know about that. You need to have a very, uh, you know, robust uh, filters designed for this. And again, you've got also a lot of FIR filters coming in handy to deal with the different uh, uh, easy artifacts that come during the time of a measurement. So these are uh, some of the artifacts. They are related not just to the easy signals. They come with... Uh, uh, they, they interfere with any of the physiological signals that you take. Okay? So the movements, body movements, okay? that is uh, the muscular movements, they involve the, uh, the muscles and uh, the cells associated with that. So they also give you what is called as uh, EMG. And you have all these things. ECG is, of course, like it, it uh, uh, overrides every possible physiological signal that you can uh, take. So you have that. And uh, all these are the typical things, eye movement, sweating. Sweating is because your body impedance will you know, keep varying when you start sweating, okay, right? So that is where you have to take care of all these things. When, well, like, generally, we uh, clean the head, and if it's possible, uh, like uh, look for a region, uh, remove the hair, and then uh, clean it properly, apply gel, and put that that can take care of uh, more or less uh, many of the noises that can come in and um, yeah so i told you like we have other interference signals emg ecg so all this can be filtered and um, and other things that these are things that related to the physiological signal related to the movements uh, the disturbances by the patient and similarly you have a lot of electrical noise also are coming in like you have uh, the uh, 50 hertz, the power line fluctuations is always there, and then impedance fluctuations, cable movements, and etc. etc. So many of the noise uh, signals will add to these artifacts. So one has to take care of all these. 
And this just uh, shows a, a typical disturbance that you can uh, observe in the EEG waveform. So these are some standard uh, waveforms that you find in any of the EEG, any one of the biomedical instrumentation textbooks. So this is when you have the 50 hertz interference, the power line interference. This is when you're moving the eyes, when the eyeballs are moving. And uh, that is also going to create a lot of noise here. And then this is blinking of the eye. And these are typical things that they're all expected. We all know like how these eye movements are going to figure in the EEG signals and how blinking of an eye, this closing and opening of an eye, and as well as uh, involuntary blinking of the eye. So a general idea is there about all that. So filters can be easily designed to remove all these uh, external noise that happens because of the patient's enzyme. And uh, these are the typical filters that we have. Okay, so low pass filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, notch filter and all that. So we can use all these filters depending upon which type of EEG signal is under a study. Okay, so based upon that, apart from filtering out the noise signal, uh, we'll uh, see later the EEG signal itself is a composite signal. So you have to extract each one of the component of the EEG signal. So based upon that, you can make it a choice of the filter. And um, uh, definitely, like this has to be analyzed using a software. So any uh, tool that uh, deals with the EEG signals will have to have, decide a certain sampling frequency. And uh, the 256 hertz is a typical uh, sampling frequency that would be sufficient for any of the acquisition of physiological signals, B, T, C, D, or EEG. Generally, it is 256 hertz that is fixed and that will be sufficient. And now, um, EEG signal is, uh, uh, looking at the nature of the EEG signal itself, we can make out that it is not a pure signal, it is a composite signal. And the fundamental, uh, I mean, like uh, various literatures uh, classify a number of uh, brain waves. Okay? So, but the major, uh, you got about four major waves called as delta, theta, alpha, beta, and uh, slightly under consideration is gamma waves also, and uh, you find uh, different uh, literatures giving you more waves than that. Oh, they very rarely occur. So generally, so these are uh, the four waves, delta, theta, alpha, and beta waves are generally observed. So what are these uh, delta waves? You can see that so if you just uh, extract this delta wave, so this is how it will look like. This is one of the slowest waves that is present in the EEG signal. And this frequency is around uh, 0 to 4 hertz. Okay. So this is observed during deep sleep in most people. Okay. So if it's a, a person is, uh, uh, is, uh, sleep, is in deep sleep and if it doesn't have any sleep disorders, then this is the slow wave that you would find. So people who have all those... Uh, uh, sleep disorders and many of the neurological disorders. So this uh, four hertz, it will not be a slow wave. Uh, uh, it will have, sometimes the amplitude will go much higher. This two, 20 to 200 microvolt, what you're seeing. So if they're a hyperactive people, so then that means uh, you observe that in people who are hyperactive in sleep. Like what do you mean by hyperactive in sleep? There is uh, the sleepwalking and uh, all those uh, uh, states those can be easily detected by studied by observing the uh, delta wave. Generally, it is a slow frequency. And if it's normal and the person is happy, so you find the slow waves only when they are uh, sleeping. OK, the uh, next we move to the uh, theta waves. So theta waves is the next uh, category which is between 4 to 8 above the lowest frequency range and again you have this one so you can see that this is a slightly uh, faster compared to the previous one and this is uh, ability to be more common in uh, children than adults so theta waves are observed uh, generally when we are you know idling or daydreaming or when you're drowsy so in such cases you feel theta waves are not really into sleep but it's almost sleep like condition like when you're or drowsing, okay, when you are you know, not uh, uh, actively doing something, it's almost uh, closer to the sleep state. So that is what you observe, a theta 
ways. And why these ways are important is we are not getting into the clinical analysis of these ways. So when you get into the clinical analysis, each one of the this neural disorders, neurological disorders, calls for an extensive study of the brain waves in the given range. Okay, in the given range. So that is in that context, each one of these different waves attain importance. And next is we have got the alpha waves. So alpha waves is uh, again above that frequency band. So you can see the fastness of the wave indicated here. So it is between 8 to 13 hertz, 8 to 13 hertz and the slow amplitude. So this you find when you are not disturbed, when you are not stressed, when you are relaxed, when you are calm and peaceful, but you are not a drowsing. Okay? Okay, but with, you're not a drowsing, so it should be the alpha waves. Okay? So like I hope uh, right now when I'm giving you this lecture, you people are relaxed and listening and you should be, or your brain should be elucidating the alpha waves and not theta waves. Okay? So theta waves is a state of drowsiness. Alpha waves is you're not drowsing, you're well awake, you're peaceful, you're relaxed, you're calm. And that is what we all should be when we are quiet, we should be illustrating alpha waves. Okay? And next we move to the beta waves. So beta waves is again falls about 14 to 30 hertz. And so these are all typical frequency bands. So these frequency bands, like using the filters, you can extract each one of them um, from the composite EEG waves. Okay? I told you, like, uh, like we do have in our laboratory uh, a setup called as power lab. So where it, it uh, help, I mean, it uh, allows us in acquiring EEG signals and extracting all these signals. So this is all done as a part of the uh, study of the medical instrumentation lab in our course. So you can easily extract and you get all this beautiful waveform from the very irregularly shaped EEG signal when you apply filters. Okay? So you'll get to see all these. And then you can apply only minimum number of electrodes and you can still observe all these. Okay. So these are the most common form of brain waves. So these beta waves are observed when you're focused and you're doing something. Okay. So you're focused, you're not just uh, relaxing without uh, thinking anything. When you're uh, focusing, when you're doing something, so you'll be, uh, I know your brain wave will be illustrating beta waves. So like, you know, as a presenter, I'm very focused on what I'm presenting and I'm conscious of what I'm talking, words I'm using. So I'm sure I will be actually now in the 14 to 30 hertz band. And as a listener, you will be in the alpha band. Okay, so that is the uh, range. Okay, so if you check uh, during any action, so you will find that. So these are uh, the things when you call them, you know, like uh, uh, action potentials, uh, uh, event driven potentials, event driven potentials. So when we do some events and then we try to observe the potential so all these different potentials waves can be easily extracted so most people operate in this band during the day that means you are thinking you are reasoning you are focusing and you are highly alert so will be all the time beta waves okay when you're not doing something and if you are if you're not concentrating, I mean, if you're not doing something, if you're not doing a certain task, and if you're still, uh, your brain is still giving beta wave, it shows that you are stressed. Okay? You are stressed. If you're not stressed, we'll be giving only the, giving out the alpha waves. So we have done a study on that. So I'll be coming to that. So that is what, and most of us, you know, like uh, we know that way we all are in these days, so beta waves all the time. And this is the, gamma waves so gamma waves is uh, very rarely found so this is a high frequency range 36 to 44 hertz and um, uh, you know like generally normal persons we all will be uh, in the last uh, four bands maximum up to the beta band and you got the gamma waves so gamma waves are, are supposed to be coming out of the abnormal brains, abnormal brains, or the, or that means people we are hyperactive, you know whom I mean, mean when we say they are hyperactive, not a sound at mind, so they will be always in this disturbed brain, 36 to 
44 hertz actually if they can focus that and if they use that they can do tremendous things but that doesn't happen so normally it's restricted up to beta waves and if you observe the is supposed to be in normal persons then it's going to be uh, an indication of hyperactivity or highly disturbed and there are on earth a category of people who are very peaceful and who still elucidate this gamma waves so i'll come to that at the end of my presentation so this is what like you have so i just uh, you know put a reference here so you have a lot of references which gives you uh, in case if anybody is interested you can just look into that what each band is for and what are the neurological disorders associated uh, that can be determined from studying each one of the bands so i just chose one reference here and i just put that i think it will be uh, it'll be given with the slides at the end and um, some of the research work carried out at uh, medical letters department uh, this is of course the student uh, uh, project that we are guided we have you know like uh, this was one of a very simple uh, brain computer interface uh, project that was carried out uh, quite uh, almost about five to six to seven years before so brain computer interface brain computer interface or it's also called a brain machine interface this is a kind of a feedback between there's a biological feedback like we have a kind of biological feedback you give out a signal you a thing of doing something and uh, you'll be driving uh, some machine to do that particular or uh, task okay? so that is there is a um, interface between the machine and the brain so all of us know brain computer interface so this is uh, again you have this based upon the uh, non-invasively placed electrodes which uh, generate the EEG waves based upon certain thoughts and thoughts will trigger an action. I repeat like you have the electrodes placed non-invasively over the scalp and uh, the person who is subjected to be using this particular device will be thinking or will be giving out a certain thought to do a particular task and then he'll be elucidating a particular kind of EEG waves. So those EEG waves will be interpreted and they will interpret it, they will interpret what action the particular patient or the subject is thinking of doing and that will be uh, carried out using the machine. So this is reading out the mind of a person and performing a task by the computer. That is what a brain computer interface is. And uh, these, I mean, this is very limited applications. What we have is very limited applications uh, because uh, the many uh, limitations associated with the non-invasive electrodes. So the major things, applications, what you find uh, is uh, in people who have the motor disability, that is, uh, who are not capable of uh, complete uh, limb movement. So in such people like to assist them cruise through the wheelchair etc so they'll be using so there are only certain limited commands will be given the move right move left go ahead and all that so with that limited movements as brain computer interfaces right now is into the application into right now so it uh, has a very good uh, uh, scope without any you know boundaries to grow so we have this, this is one of the things what we did uh, our project was just to turn an LED on and off. Uh, the candidate will think to glow an LED. He'll be just thinking the LED will be turned on. He'll be thinking to put it off and a particular wave will go and then the LED will be off. So this was one of the uh, projects that was successfully uh, carried out. It was done using LabVIEW. So LabVIEW that uh, easy signals were acquired and they were interfaced to lab view through the DAC card we have, the DAC card we have. So all the filtering, amplifying, everything was done. And uh, you know, like what we do is, uh, we have this, yeah. So this is a typical diagram that uh, will give you an idea. So the lab view was used as a tool to interpret the EEG signals. Uh, you can see that the EEG signal that was um, picked up through the electrodes and uh, interpreted by the DAC card after applying amplification and uh, filtering it 
or you will get a signal something like this and from there you perform a spectral analysis and uh, you cut it put a threshold to the spectrum this power spectrum you put a spectrum uh, threshold to the spectrum and if the threshold exceeds a particular value that is set in the program then you give a command for the LED to turn on okay similarly so if the threshold does not if the power spectrum value does not reach the threshold if it is below the threshold you turn the led off so this was what our project uh, successfully carried out and it looks very simple but uh, yes of course the lab view was there a very powerful uh, uh, tool uh, the dac card was also perfect in amplifying and filtering and everything was there the problem is like to give out the particular kind of thought related to an action that is very difficult not everybody can uh, you know give out a, uh, the thought for a particular action so i hope you understand like you are not capable of not everybody is capable of giving out uh, the eeg waves are producing eeg waves corresponding to a, an action i mean thoughts should be very focused and this was uh, uh, a student named gautam so from uh, of course project uh, from his project mates only he was able to uh, control the led on and off okay. so he was focusing or uh, the brain waves were captured properly and repeatedly we could uh, test with uh, his eeg waves whenever he wanted the led to turn on he sent a particular signal which exceeded the uh, threshold and it was on and it goes the same principle is applied even when you think of some command like if you want to move if it is a wheelchair I used for a, a quadriplegic person, that means who is not uh, uh, fine at all as four limbs, and then he can think if he wants to move to the right, then if he genuinely thinks that he wants to move to the right, definitely the command will be interpreted and uh, the motor should uh, wheel towards the right or left, whichever direction you want. So all that depends upon how you train the device based on a particular subject so this becomes very subjective if i choose somebody else then his threshold levels will be different his threshold levels will be different so you have to pick a different device. so you have to customize these kind of device based upon the person and it needs rigorous training also for the person so so this is uh, where we have uh, come to brain computer interface minimum things are easily being uh, implemented now and uh, the other uh, projects that we were very much uh, interested and did was the effect of uh, the pranayama on the eeg uh, signals the pranayama on the eeg signals we say that uh, pranayama was uh, it's a proven scientifically a proven method to heal many of the neurological disorders and uh, you can test yourself you can prove yourself by uh, going for the uh, scientific uh, uh, study using the eeg signals and finding out the effects of pranayama on a person and how the person was before he practiced pranayama and how after i mean after he become a practitioner of pranayama so this is going to have a very pronounced effect and uh, this uh, project uh, was carried out in association with uh, the uh, Vyasa okay, so uh, that's in uh, other institute situated in uh, Bangalore uh, yes Vyasa uh, it's a uh, Sri Vivekananda Yoga Anishtana Samsthana it's a um, it comes under Aish uh, funded by the central government it's a uh, university in Bangalore, so where they have you know like all the sophisticated equipment so they just don't use it only for the diagnosis they even use it uh, for the therapeutic uh, means of the uh, are curing uh, particular diseases using this yoga and pranayama so let i'll just brief out uh, this particular project that was carried out we got the data from the es vasa so they, they, they used uh, for the 128 electrode uh, system and the software that was uh, a sophisticated uh, uh, software called as net station was used so all that does is it uh, collects all the 128 channels of data 
and gives you the uh, data. It gives you the data and the data, what, whatever data we got from the next station, the, all the 128 channels, so that was processed using the easy toolbox. You know, easy toolbox is an open source uh, software that can be easily used with a MATLAB. So there is uh, hardly anything for uh, the researcher to do. Only thing is they should know like what uh, frequency content to extract and how to apply that. So we got the data, so data pre-processing and uh, sample ensemble creation. That means creating the huge data by separately for each one of the uh, channels. So all this was done through the uh, net station. And uh, what we did was uh, go for the feature extraction and find out the dominant frequency band. I'll just give you the, yeah, this, this shows a placement of 128 channels. So more the number of channels, more information you get. And you'll be covering what's happening at different uh, part of the brain. So what we did was, you know, like uh, the easy toolbox, it allows us to pick any channel you want. On the 128 channel, you can pick any channel. And uh, usually this uh, uh, data, you can have it recorded over a very long duration of a uh, time. And you can run an epoch wise for a particular uh, time duration and repeat that. And we can do all that. You can pick any channel you want and you can analyze the channel and you can pick uh, the time duration also. So all that can be uh, done. So what we did was we tried it with uh, the signals from all the different major regions major regions when we try to find out the spectral component. So this was also a part of the EG toolbox. The EG toolbox gives you a very in detailed spectral analysis. You can perform any one of the spectral analysis you want. So we found that, so this actually was, uh, okay, so before going to this one, so this is uh, what we're seeing is, uh, the effect of pranayama. So effect of pranayama means like uh, you, we should not, uh, I mean, we, it's not like that just anybody can perform pranayama for a while and then uh, uh, think the EEG level has uh, arised. No, it doesn't happen. So this actually data set was uh, taken uh, from uh, periodical, uh, from a regular practitioners of uh, pranayama, regular practitioners of pranayama and then a sample uh, from a group of uh, people was picked up and those samples were given for the study. So these people were the regular uh, practitioners of uh, pranayama. Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, find any pronounced effect. So this particular one, so I just put only one of the uh, channels uh, frequency uh, component. You'll see that this uh, shows a peak only at 10 hertz. It shows a peak at 10 hertz and uh, that means uh, the maximum power spectrum or power spectral value, some threshold is identified at 10 hertz. Okay, so 10 hertz is um, associated with the alpha band. Okay, so 10 hertz is associated with the alpha band. So this is done. You, we can do, we did it actually before, uh, in the quiet settings before the pranayama and uh, uh, the quiet settings after the uh, pranayama. So we have observed both the things. So in the quiet settings after the pranayama, like the people were more relaxed and we could find that they were uh, the maximum or the dominant wave that was being emitted was a tenor that was the alpha wave. So that is, it shows that so you can remain more calm and peaceful after the pranayama. So, and if you're doing it regularly, there will be a total shift in the base of the EEG signal itself. The entire EEG signal's base level itself gets shifted if you are a very regular practitioner of the pranayama. And so we did various tests and for the lack of space and time, I just put only one sample just to illustrate that. So this was maximum frequency was 10 hertz, implying that there were quite relaxed and peaceful after that. Okay. So this was again, you know, different um, forms of pranayama. So alternate uh, nostril 
uh, breathing and then the right nostril and left nostril breathing so after everything there are some of the uh, regions where we could not get clear values so we are just but it was all because of the lack of uh, uh, connection problem or something like that some areas we were not uh, waveform was not very clear so otherwise in the right parietal right central parietal and left parietal and also left central parietal we have observed the waveforms very close to the 10 hertz so it shows that what kind of relaxing effect the pranayama can give to it just, we had around 40 to 45 samples and every sample we would see the same effect so this just suggests, as I told you, like uh, like if it is a quiet sitting without specific direction, that means if you're sitting without, uh, uh, you know, like then you'll be always thinking. So when we are thinking, uh, you are you are not at peace, and then uh, uh, the band that is uh, uh, coming out will can uh, easily be in the beta band. So but if it is with after, yeah, after meditation, then it can. Uh, go up to uh, the alpha band, go down to the alpha band, it will be relaxed. So this is what uh, we are able to find. And this is, uh, uh, I'll just uh, mention this also. And we had another um, a study. Again, this was uh, to prove the effect of pranayama on patients uh, suffering from hypoglycemia. So this is hypoglycemia is uh, the low blood sugar level. So this is uh, something very frequently observed in people who suffer from a long-term uh, diabetic. So very often, very frequently they get into this hypoglycemia condition where the blood level, blood sugar level will drop like anything and uh, they can that can even uh, prove to be fatal also. So this was one of the uh, studies taken at uh, uh, Espasa and they had shared those uh, uh, waveforms all those easy waveforms and we just uh, did a, a study again on this uh, to prove like how pranayama can have a, a slowly a lasting effect on the patients of hypoglycemia. So these were the studies what they conducted uh, on the patients at their place and they also move uh, to the places and they take the study, move to the places where patients are there and they take the a study in case the patient is not uh, uh, capable of coming and staying with them. This usually has to be done over a, uh, a long period, long period. So you have to give them the pranayama, you have to train them for over a long period and over a long period of time, if there is any effect, so that was what was observed here. So according to the study that was conducted there and uh, what uh, we uh, perform the analysis on the signal that was shared by the ASVASA. We conducted how it was showing an effect of the delta band and alpha band in the beginning of the uh, uh, in the beginning of the training of the meditation and after about uh, 45 days. Okay, I'll just uh, show you this one delta band. Does it uh, okay? So we'll come to the alpha band. If you see the second table, what we have put. You just observe these frequencies. At day one, the frequency with the, that gave maximum power was around this much. It was all closer to 8 hertz. And after the pranayama practicing for about 45 days or so, so they observed a slightly increase in the frequency level, 10, 11 hertz, etc. So it was more deeper into the alpha band. It's deeper into the alpha band. So there is a comparison again here. Uh, I think I'll show you this one. Okay, I think this uh, slide should give you a better idea. And uh, this gives you the spectral study of a normal person and uh, the spectral study of a hypoglycemia, a patient. A normal person, this is the delta band, so he should be insulating the delta band in this range, zero point, well, it's about zero to four hertz, zero to four hertz, zero point four two, etc. This is the maximum power. And you can see that, so here also, after 45 days, the hypoglycemia patient's band will also come almost closer with the band, delta band of the normal person. And 
coming down here so this is the alpha band of the normal person so 9.23 9.56 etc some normal adult and this was based on the training on the hypoglycemia patient so after about 45 days you could see that there was a marginal shift from 8.2 to 9.3 8.4 9.3 8.4 etc so there was a overall shift in the alpha band after practicing about 45 days at the end of 45 days you can observe that this whatever i've highlighted here this as well as the normal persons both becomes almost matching almost matching so the alpha band tries to improve so that means they don't get into the coma state or something like that what happens when their blood sugar level drops so they can control the person's uh, Okay, you know, state of awakeness, even in case of hypoglycemia patient. So that is under uh, study, so it's going on. So there are so many uh, such effects that one can conduct based upon the EEG signals. You can, depending upon whatever case study you take, you have to perform the EEG, you have to acquire the EEG signals and perp use one of these EEG toolboxes and uh, look into the spectral content in detail about each individual channels and at different different regions it is not just one channel some region so you have to look into all the 128 channels or how many ever electrodes you are using all the channels all the signals and then average them and then you find out the dominant uh, region then only you can come to a, a conclusion so you will see that we can uh, perform uh, many of the analysis and you can use them as a diagnostic tool for identifying many of the neurological disorders. Okay. So these are some of the case studies what we have done. So there's a, a, it's a limitless and uh, anybody can do most of these things in the lab because uh, uh, you just need to have about a three set of electrodes but of course you need to have a very a uh, good, uh, you know, electronic equipment from uh, uh, established uh, manufacturers. What we have is uh, an equipment from Australia. So that's, uh, it gives us very beautiful waveforms and we can just uh, perform any uh, conditions. We have any, any test you can perform using that particular machine. And of course, Easy Toolbox is uh, uh, free. It's an open source and we can uh, work and uh, the researchers can do a lot of activity in there. And what have we talked so far was all about the, uh, you know, non-invasive uh, things. So, and I also told you, like, if you can go for invasive mechanism, so that will prove to be, it's something like the man playing uh, a god. So that is what uh, the Elon Musk's neural link is all about. Okay, so I hope uh, it won't be, you know, like uh, too many years ahead before this becomes uh, a reality. So knowing the uh, dedication of Elon Musk and his team. So we have the neural link. So what they are doing right now is they're going for an uh, invasive implanting of EEG chip. So they have around 3000 and odd channels. Just think that they're going to integrate a chip. They have fabricated a chip which can uh, give you around 3000 channel, 3000 channels. And that is uh, in a surgery has to be performed and it is invasive. So they're going to place it without damaging the brain about uh, the, uh, the layers, the thick cortical layers. And uh, to be very precise when they are doing it, they're using, uh, I know, neuro-robotic surgery methods. They're doing neuro-robotic surgery methods to implant this chip inside. This has got about 3,000 uh, channels. So they can predict everything and they can once you have those signals, you can do wonders with the signals. Yeah, some students there. So that is uh, what is going to be the future. So we can just hope that like uh, nobody will uh, motion anything like that. I'm just coming to conclusion. So, so. Can you please unmute? Can you please mute yourself? Somebody.
Okay, well, so that is the future. So we are looking ahead for a bright future where uh, you can predict the cases and uh, uh, you know, try to overcome all the motor disorders. So that's uh, going to be a promising uh, future with uh, the neural. <laughs> And this is one thing what I wanted to share you all, share with you all. So this is about uh, a Buddhist monk. You know, this is the study conducted at uh, Wisconsin uh, University in USA. It showed that, like, uh, they actually uh, wanted to test uh, the uh, EEG waves of these monks and what range it is going to be. So one of the Buddhist monks uh, from Nepal, he volunteered himself and then. They tested on it, they found, I mean, they were very surprised with whatever uh, EEG waves that they found on him. So he was emancipating the gamma waves, the highest waves, the gamma waves while he was meditating. And he was easily able to shift from meditation to rest. That means he was able to move from one band to the other band. So they thought that might be um, a fluke case. So, uh, so they wanted to go further into that. So they had an, a set of around 20 or 20 and odd Buddhist monks. Okay, so they went all the way to the Wisconsin University. So the study was conducted there. And you know what one uh, monk uh, proved was proved to be the same thing with all the cases. And they even found out that the base EEG level signal itself was, I mean, during the normal activity also it was in the gamma rays. I told you in the beginning gamma rays as we consider it to be very abnormal because we are not able to use that high uh, uh, energy that is being uh, coming out of the brain. But these people can, uh, they were elucidating that particular gamma band and they were in a very controlled state. So that is uh, what the effect of uh, pranayama is going to have on the uh, EEG signals and the base level with which we can work. So that it, it's all uh, goes to prove that so you can remain peaceful, calm, even under stressed uh, conditions if you are a regular practitioner of pranayama or meditation. So with that uh, note, I would like to conclude. And if you people have any queries, yeah, my acknowledgement to all my uh, students and uh, the uh, external uh, Deepeshwar Singh um, the prof associate professor from Espasa University who was uh, giving us all the data and uh, correcting us in our uh, studies. Because I would like to acknowledge their contribution for this presentation. Thank you. Any query? Uh, participants, any queries? It will be appreciated. I hope I didn't put you all the forum is open for the participants. Uh -huh. So, any uh, doubts? You can come for. Ravish, shall we mind? Yeah, madam. I have one question, madam. As of my interest, I am having one question because of yes. my area of uh, research is also EEG, but you worked in BCA also. Uh, if BCA can be works uh, very good uh, and use a good output result, if it is a trained by particular person, is it so, no, ma'am? I didn't need to Ravish. For a now, in independent person, I mean, patient independent person, if BCA is designed, that will give very successful uh, rate, or it can be generally we can design BCA application. No, for, no, no, that's what uh, I think it has to be customized. I think it has to be customized. customized. It all depends upon uh, it should be customized, like uh, because uh, to some extent, of course, you can generalize it. But the thing is, like, you have to give a rigorous training. So that will be very important if you're not. Yeah. If you're customizing, then it's fine. If you're not customizing, then you have to train the person. So otherwise, you know, like the particular amplitude and particular uh, uh, the particular wave will be difficult. And so, 
Uh, because I am able to understand from your uh, topic of this thing, so thought is that it will be trained, it will be there. The person is training, then it will be the results are very encouraging and uh, the performance will be good. So we can identify that thoughts and all. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, you can uh, customize training has to be there. I feel like it's very important because we have seen from our experience only. Not everybody was able to. But it, uh, it differs from one person many, to the many, other. Some people will. Yeah, yeah it will. It will differ. It will differ because uh, um, this was what from our own experience. Like when we are doing it in a group of people, yeah. we tried with everyone in the group, but it wouldn't work with all of them. It would work with only a uh, selected one person. So that has been my experience. So I think you have to customize. If you're generalizing it, then if it is uh, invasive, I think you can generalize it. Right. Uh, any any participant any quick one or two questions they will take it in uh, yeah if it is not so it is uh, my privilege and uh, my pleasure to propose vote of thanks uh, to our own department and hosting uh, department and uh, we here for the uh, structure of architect of uh, this entire program is by uh, professor and head uh, dr kj shanti resource person and I thank you very much, madam, for the support. And uh, she is the right person, worked a lot and uh, developed me. So, particularly, EG applications, so various projects have been uh, developed and devised. And uh, till that, uh, realized all the applications uh, wide. But we generally know about the fundamentals alpha, beta, delta, theta. In the madam's talk, uh, she told about it should not be exact replicant, it should not be never, uh, not repeating. The same thing, uh, ma'am, also, professor has given the justice. Never touch upon the so much things, and uh, the topic content was given the application part and various projects that you realize in the project are uh, her experience she shared. I thank you very much, ma'am, on uh, behalf of uh, the college management and the Atal FDP fraternity. And from the, all the participants, I thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Ravish, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Then for the participant, you fill the mark your attendance and after that uh, you can uh, leave the session and tomorrow we will once again meet in the morning for the fourth day at 9.30 sharp. Uh, any, any remarks or any, any information to convey? And now it is for 5-10 minutes I will be here and you can communicate to me uh, about the coordinators or feedback, anything you are facing difficulty or any other thing. You can feel free to uh, talk now. I, I am available another two, three minutes. Uh, two, uh, two, three minutes. And uh, you wanted to share something, uh, information, you can convey to me. Yeah, if not, we'll uh, leave today. Have a good day. And uh, we'll meet once again tomorrow.